Hey guys, my name is Caleb and I am so excited that you clicked on this video on YouTube. We are in a series called Family Matters and we pray that this uh, conversation that we had tonight would touch your heart. Uh, we're talking about the, fa about the family, uh, whether your family's perfect or whether it's totally fractured and whether it's cha changing, all these different things that happen when it comes to family. We believe that this conversation is very important for us to have. If you'd like to see some more content, you can go to Instagram and you can follow us at students underscore GFC. You'll find the times of our service and everything. We meet live uh, on Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m. and we would love for you to join us. time of worship. Hey, students, do me a favor, and why don't y'all just give your, your parents a hand for hanging in with us this long, you know? They've made it to this point. I think they can survive until eight, you know what I mean? So anyways, uh, I am... Let me go ahead and just say this. I, I try to say this as much as I have the opportunity to say this when, when I'm in a space and I can talk to you parents. I try to say it when I'm in individually with you guys. Uh, I consider I, I have uh, officially thank you buddy I appreciate you you know I don't know I don't know if I'll need it or not but we'll keep it over here just in case um, but I, I consider it one of the greatest joys of my life to get to do ministry uh, to your teenagers uh, I value the fact that you allow me uh, to pour me and my wife and our team uh, here at Grace Fellowship Church we are just so grateful for the opportunity to pour into your teenagers and uh, it, it's just a moment for me of just sitting back there and just seeing homes worship together is just, uh, it's such an incredible blessing um, to get to do what I do uh, every single weekend. And I, I, uh, I was listening to a message, and I, I want to say this because just kind of uh, before I get into to tonight's the topic, we're starting a, a series called Family Matters, but uh, I was listening to a, um, a message by Pastor Johnny Hunt. Anybody heard, heard of Pastor Johnny Hunt? I only heard of him because Pastor Roy and all the staff members listened to him. I never listened to him. I'm like, he's great. I like this guy. And I was listening to one of his messages the other day, and he said, he said, um, leader, you can't lead who you don't believe in. And I thought that was so profound because um, I was talking to an, another pastor, actually one of the pastors at this, this church, one of the other churches that meets here, and uh, he was talking about the next generation and the next generation and and, I, and not, nothing necessarily negative, but I said, you know what's so interesting to me is that the media always publicizes, you know, it always puts out the, the worst of any, anybody, right? You know, you know, that's what the media does. And I, and I said, you know what, I, I, I think I can't watch the media when it comes to teenagers because my teenagers aren't like that. I believe in them to be world changers. Teenagers, I believe in you guys to change the world, to affect your schools, to be a difference maker, and to advance the gospel. And so... I love what I get to do, and I'm excited for us to all be in the same space tonight, <clears throat> getting to worship together and getting to get and dive into God's Word. Before I get into uh, the topic matter that I have for tonight, we're starting a series called Family Matters, and we want to talk about the dynamic of family. And so I want you to uh, think about in your mind, that is a rhetorical question, but like when you think of family, what comes to mind? And think about what comes, what, when, when I say the word family, what automatically starts to roll as you think about family. I think about my mom and my dad. <clears throat> I think about my little sister, Kaya. My little sister, Kaya, is great. I want to bring her here sometimes so y'all can meet her, but I love her. She's great. Uh, but my little sister, Kaya, I think of my Papa Wayne. He's great, too. He always gives me the, just the great advice. My Papa Wayne's my grandpa, by the way. You know, everybody's got to have a nickname for their grandpa. Uh, but my Papa Wayne, I think of my Momo. I think uh, that's my grandma as well, too. Okay, <laughs> don't make fun of her. Uh, <laughs> I love her, okay. Um, uh, but anyway, so I think of, my, I think of uh, beach trips. We would always go to Myrtle Beach, and that was like kind of our, like our family tradition. My family was big on family traditions, so I would think of those family traditions. I'd think of uh, Christmas traveling, and I would think of all of these uh, different things. And, and, and we all, this is, I say all that to say we all have a little bit of a different perspective when it comes to family. Like there's a different thing that comes to mind. Maybe you think uh, of a mom and a dad. Maybe you think of, of foster parents who are mom and dad. 
Maybe you think of a, gram, a, a grandma or a grandpa that stepped in and really filled a role that you didn't necessarily have in your life. Maybe you think uh, uh, of an aunt or an uncle. We all think different things when it comes to family. And, and, and I kind of thought about this a little bit uh, when it comes to family. This is the reality. This is the truth when it comes to family. Uh, Matt, you could throw it up on the screen. Every family is unique. Every family is unique. We're not all the same. We all have a different, different makeup. We're all a little bit different. And here's another truth about family. We're all unique. The family is unique. Family is also complicated. Family can be chaotic. Family can be, family can be overwhelming. Family can be filled with uh, awesome moments, and it can also feel like it's filled with awful moments. Family can be very complicated and overwhelming. You know what I thought about, too, when it comes to family? You have these awesome moments, and what I mean by awesome moments are these, these are like the highest of the highs when it comes to your, like the, the best moments. You have these awesome moments, but then you also have these kind some of, some awful moments that, you, uh, that maybe you think of that are maybe the things that, you, they're, they're kind of the low moments. And as I was kind of reflecting at that, my personal experience is that all of the awesome moments seemed like they didn't last long enough, and all of the awful ones seemed like they stayed way too long. Right, And it doesn't seem like we're in the middle very much. And family is unique. It's complicated, but it's a great thing. And this is what I also thought about when it comes to family. It's really interesting. What you do is you, you take a family, and then you put them all in a box. Some people have a bigger box than others. Some people have a smaller box. You call it a house. You know what I'm saying? And then you, like, shake up all these different personalities, and that just makes for a lot of fun, right? You know what I'm saying? You know, like, 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 you think about family conflict, okay? We have, you know, we have, we have a little bit of a disagreement. Uh, you have avoiders. Has anybody ever thought you're, like, an avoider? You know what I'm talking about? You have the avoider personality. You're like, all right, there's, there's, there's some chaos. Here's my video game. You know what I mean? You're over in the corner avoiding the situation, or maybe you're turning to social media or something. We have avoiders in the family. Anybody an avoider? You an avoider? Okay, we have some avoiders. And then we have, uh, we have the, the, great, the great people who are the mediators. They're like the family referee. They put on like the, it's like mom is mad at brother because brother didn't take out the trash. Therefore, middle sibling steps in and says, let me, let me diffuse everything. Then you have the instigator. So the mediator is putting on the referee jersey trying to keep some peace in the home. And then you have the instigator who comes and says, let me just drop a flame right there. You know what I mean? You have the mediator who's trying to blow the candle out of chaos, but then you have the instigator who's like, no, I'm going to burn the whole house down. Then you have, you have unique kids that are all of them, and I don't understand how that works, but <laughs> you have comedians. You have the comedian, yeah, Greg. <laughs> you have the comedian, you know, you have the com- you're the comedian in the family, right? Like, you're the funny, you're the funny guy or the, you're the funny whatever, right? Like, you're, you're trying to uh, make a lighthearted situation, and then sometimes you end up cracking a joke that gets you grounded for a month, and you're like, man, I was just trying to be funny, you know? We have the smart people. Then we have the rule followers. These are the ones you pray for, parents, right? You pray for them, right? You're like, we have the rule followers, and we're like, we're tr- going to try to align and do the right thing, and we're going to try uh, to do what we need to do when it comes to trying to kind of avoid some conflict, get some stuff resolved. Now, I um, want to dive into a conversation tonight out of John chapter 13. If you would turn with me to John chapter 13. And I want to say something, parents. I'm gonna, there's, there's maybe a couple times in this message I'll point to parents, and there's sometimes I'll point to students. And, uh, and, and we're going to be in John chapter 13, and we'll look at that for a minute. It's not a text of scripture that you probably haven't heard before, but I'm hoping that as we uh, talk about family, it'll really touch your heart. And teenagers, what do we do? Tell our parents what we do. We take notes. So take some notes. Yes. Great leaders, the greatest leaders are the greatest note takers because we retain significantly more when we write things down. I want to say something to you parents, though, because I was thinking about this on my car ride uh, home from Columbus this weekend. The, the average teenager, you have their lifespan from the time that they're born to the time that they exit your home at 18. We're going to call it 18. Some of you are going to be blessed with 35-year-olds in your basement. (laughs) Those are unique. Maybe you guys are going to have a better blessing of time than others, but the average teenager is kind of moving on to a new life stage when they're around 18, going into 19, 
And I was thinking about that. Now, I'm not the math guy. Matt's the math guy uh, on our staff. He does, he does all the numbers. But I had to punch this into my calculator. Actually, Matt's the everything guy on our staff. He kind of does a little bit of everything. But uh, I, I um, was thinking about the time that you have from the, the day that your, your kid is born to 18. 6,570 days of time that you have with your, teen- with your teenager. Now, if you think about that, now the reality is, is um, you don't have that much longer left. For some of you, they're, they're 11, 12, and that's, that number's cut down to a couple thousand days that you have with your teenager before the relationship starts to look a little bit different. They graduate, and you still have the opportunity to invest in them. But my prayer is that as a result of tonight, we will make the most of whatever time left we have with them in our home. And I say that because I think that we always think that there's more time than there is. And I believe fully that um, you have a great opportunity. If you're not using it already, I believe the fact that you're here probably says that you're using it. But you have a great opportunity to steward the, oppor- the, to steward the God-given gift that is called a disciple, which is your child. And so I'm excited to get into this text. John chapter 13, I'm going to ask everybody to stand as we read this passage of scripture now. <clears throat> stretch yourself. Yeah, we're going to stretch ourselves, crack your back if you need to. If your neighbor's falling asleep, don't slap them because of COVID, but it's all good. John chapter 13, and I'm going to step over here so I can just read it straight off the screen. Matt, it's all good. It says this, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas the Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper... And he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Next slide. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you, to you? Do you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. That's important. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another another's feet for I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you truly truly I say to you a servant is not greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him if you know these things blessed are you if you do them I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Two more verses. We're going to skip down. A new commandment. I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. But this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I titled my message two two things tonight. You can choose whichever one you want. I'm going to try to tie a bow on them here uh, by the end of our time. 
Difficult dinner dynamics and from seats to surfaces. Difficult dinner dynamics or from seats to surfaces. You can take whichever one you want if it helps you remember something tonight. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. I got to pray that as we go through your word for a few remaining minutes here, God, that you would just do much with the time that we have together as we look at the text. God, would you speak to our hearts right where we're at, right in the middle of wherever our family is currently struggling, any difficulties that may be on the surface, or maybe even the difficulties that would be up ahead, maybe even the things that we don't know are happening, but maybe we need to be exposed to in our hearts. God, I pray that you would do something supernatural in this space. God, I pray that homes would be healthier, that family dynamics would look different, and God, that we would walk out of this place, not just hearing your word and doing nothing about it, but hearing your word and actively pursuing doing something uh, with it. We pray all these things in the unmatched name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen, amen. You guys can sit down. I won't make you sit, stand for any longer than that. <clears throat> John chapter 13, we enter into this text where we're sitting at the scene of a dinner. Everybody say dinner. We're at a scene of a dinner, and we are at a meal with Jesus. Jesus is sitting with 12 of his closest friends. I want to point this out before we kind of go a little bit further into the text. You have to understand that these friends for Jesus, uh, they were more like family. The, these, these friends, these disciples, he had spent now three years of his life eating with them, laughing with them, uh, he, he correcting them, encouraging them, affirming them, teaching alongside them, healing in front of them, really imparting everything that God had given to him, everything that uh, God had revealed to everything, uh, everything about Jesus, he's imparted into these disciples. You have to understand this. As they've traveled, these friends feel more like family. They feel closer than just friends, than just disciples, and they're going to take the church when Jesus leaves. But here's the thing. You have to understand the scene of this dinner that we're in. The scene of the dinner that we're in, Jesus is sitting at the table, and this is the final meal that he is going to have with these friends that he has uh, been so close to that are more like family than friends. And, and, and you have to try to put your, 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 your envision sitting at this dinner table where Jesus is with his disciples who feel more like family than just friends. They are very, very close. And he's the only one who knows this is the last meal that we're going to eat together. Jesus is the only one who knows this is the last bite that I'm going to take with my brothers. He already knows that uh, Judas has been, it's been uh, kind of revealed to, it's, it, it, Satan has already put upon Judas that he's going to betray him. All of this stuff that happened. And Jesus is the only one who is sitting at the table that knows this is the last meal in which we're going to have together. Jesus is the only one. Think about how complicated it would be to sit at a table and you know this is the last time I'm going to have a conversation with Peter over a bite to eat. I kind of was trying to think, like, what, what is Jesus thinking in this moment? I'm sure he's kind of looking at a guy like Peter and thinking, man, three years ago when I picked that guy up off the side of the ocean, <laughs> He was fishing, and I was going to help him, draw him along because he had a bigger purpose. You think about Matthew, I picked him up while he was trying to take people's money. John, that guy, he just thinks he's the best out of all of us, doesn't he? He does, because the, I'm the one who Jesus loved. He's the one who actually wrote this gospel. And I can imagine what he's thinking. It must have been very complicated to know, though, that I'm the only one who knows this is the final bite that we're going to take together. Imagine if you were sitting with your family and you're the only one who knew this is the last time we're going to eat together. How difficult that may be. And then Jesus, what he does is he, he, he wants to give one final lesson, so to speak. Now, it's not that Jesus doesn't give a lesson while he's on the cross in the fact that he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's not that he didn't teach them something uh, before he sends to heaven after this moment, but it's kind of like the last lesson that he can give them across the table. They're closer than family, and he knows that his time is about to end. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus does this act where he moves from his seat at the table to the surface of the floor. 
and he, gets, he takes off his outer garment, he fills a basin or a bowl with water, and he begins to wash their feet. Now, I need you to, that sounds nasty, right? <laughs> right, like washing their feet. I remember, I was thinking about this. Like, think about your siblings, like, athletic shoes, kids. You're like, oh, it's nasty, right? I remember one time my shoes smelled so bad, I accident. my mom wouldn't let me bring my shoes into the house, just so you know. It, because it was that bad. But uh, there was one time I brought them in and she didn't know they were kind of tucked under a table or something. And she came down literally thinking that like something had died <laughs> like the next morning. It was, it was tough. But think about how awkward and nasty this would be to wash someone's feet. But you may think that it's awkward in this moment, but uh, it's really way more awkward for the disciples because uh, it, it's not awkward because it's nasty. It's awkward because Jesus is doing it. You see, Jesus is the teacher. Jesus is the rabbi. Jesus is the leader of the group. He's not the one who moves from his seat to serve somebody else. He's the one who stays in his seat and gets served by someone else. Society said that Jesus wasn't the one who would get out of his seat and wash somebody else's feet. The host would provide that for Jesus. He's the rabbi. He's the teacher. He's the leader. Think about how nasty feet were. Like I just described how gross mine were, but they were literally walking on dirt roads, dusty, muddy roads. They were walking in animal poop. <laughs> it's, it's not a job that anyone desired. Therefore, it would not be for the one who is the leader. It would not be for the one who is the rabbi. It would not be for the one who is the teacher. So it's awkward for them because it's not Jesus' job. But if you know anything about Jesus, what Jesus does is he constantly flips the standards of society. He says, you, you, you have heard it said this way, but I say it this way. You have seen it done this way, but I'm going to show you to do it this way. And so the d disciples don't know how to respond to the fact that Jesus is, has moved from the seat of being served to the surface or the floor of serving them. It's super awkward. It's different than the custom. He's flipping something that they had seen done differently, and he's doing something else with it. He moved from the seat of being served to the surface of serving somebody else. This is difficult dinner dynamics. This is an awkward situation. Peter doesn't even want to receive it at first. And can I just ask you something? I just want to ask you something. Families, what would your homes look like if you moved from the seat of wanting to be served to the surface of serving everyone in your home? Fathers, what example would it set for your kids if you woke up in the morning and said, I don't want to live to be served, but how can I serve my family? That's countercultural in the day in which we live. That's different in the day in which we live. What would it look like, dads, if, if we said, you know what, I'm going to wake up in the morning. It's not about me being served, but how can I serve my wife? How can I love her better? How can I be an example of the grace of God in my marriage so that my kids will see what, it's to, what a marriage should look like, not what the world says it is? Wives, moms, what would your home look like if you said every single morning, I don't want to wake up with the perspective of being served, but I want to wake up with the perspective of how can I serve my husband? How can I serve my kids? How can I, how can I, God designed uh, the wife to be a helpmate to the husband. It's a beautiful design. I know culture says we, we, need, to, we need to make equal look completely different, and it doesn't write along with the, the, the design of God. But I want to say this. I want to say this. What would it look like if, if the perspective of a mom waking up every single day, and I'm not saying that none of y'all are doing this. I'm just saying will we evaluate if we are or how we can do it better. What would our homes look like if we said, I want to wake up and I want to serve my family. I'm not going to look at how my family will serve me. I want to look at how... I can serve my family. I want to flip that perspective. Students, y'all are here too. What would it look like if you woke up 
in the morning and said, I don't want to, it's not about how I'm going to be served by mom and dad. How can I take something off of their plate to serve them so that I can be a better example in my own home? Oh, and can I say this? Part of serving your families isn't going to school or work and saying how bad your family is when you leave, right? What would our homes look like if we said, we're going to move from seats of being served to surfaces of serving one another. All right, let's go to, let's go to uh, uh, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. I think I have it up on the screen. A new command I give you, that you would love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What Jesus is saying, skip down a few verses, we skip over a couple of things, but what Jesus is saying is, is do you remember what the act that I just did for you? The fact that I, I, I got out of my seat and I took off my outer garment and I filled, filled up some water and I got the towel out and I washed your feet. I, I humbled myself to say I'm going to get into a different position and I'm going to serve you and I'm going to love you and I'm going to care for you. I humbled myself to be in a position of washing your dirty, gross, nasty toenails. He didn't literally say that. But what he's saying is check it out. It may have felt awkward. It may have been weird. It may have been a little bit difficult to receive. But I humbled myself to wash your feet, to show love and devotion and kindness. And that's what he says. You do the same thing. You do the same thing. Let me just put it this way. How are people going to know that you, that, you, that, you, uh, that you love Jesus? And that you're a follower of Jesus? How are people uh, going to know that you're, a clo- that you're close in your relationship with God? How are people around you going to see, uh, see the faith that you, that, that you have in Jesus Christ? They're going to, one, one simple word, love. How you love one another. The greatest testimony of, of your family to the world is how you love one another. The greatest testimony to your friends, students, is how you love your parents. Parents. The greatest testimony to the world of how you love Jesus Christ is how you love one another within your own home. And if you don't know this, your family is your first ministry. Husbands and wives, that, that's your first ministry. And your kids, ministry after that. Your home is your first ministry. But here's the thing. It seems like that's something Jesus would say, right? You should love one another. That's a great thing. Good tip, Jesus. That just sounds like something that you're going to say, right? It seems like a very Jesus type of answer. But what makes this so profound, what makes this so extraordinary is that he washed the feet of the disciples. You you don't understand how loving the act was. Jesus is washing the feet of somebody who is going to turn him over to be nailed to a cross. Jesus is washing the feet of a man who would deny him and say, I never knew the guy, bro. Jesus is getting on his hands and his knees and he is scrubbing the feet of a few people in that circle who would never have continued their relationship with him. Judas, Judas, the only one. He was going to deny, he was going to deny, he was going to trade him for some money. But check it out, check it out. Jesus still focused on love and even though he's sitting and he's the only one who knows it, I am washing the feet of Judas anyways. I'm washing the feet of my betrayer. I'm washing the feet of the one who will never want anything to do with me and, as a matter of fact, will get me stuck to the cross. I just, I, just want to, I just want to say something. When it comes to relationships, when it comes to your family, when it comes to all of this, you've you got to understand this. You've got to wash their feet anyways. That doesn't mean every single morning it's going to be easy to wash your husband's feet, wives. And I'm not talking about literally. I'm talking about spiritually. Husbands, it's not always good. Parents, check it out. There are going to be some, there's probably a lot more days where it's not very easy to wash your kid's feet from a spiritual sense. There's probably times you're like, man, you got a, you got a nice seat on the porch, <laughs> you know? I'm kidding. It's not going to be an easy thing. It's not it's not always going to be a, 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 a very easy task, but it's going to be something that you have to choose to do each and every day. 
When, 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 when they are disrespectful, you've got to wash their feet anyways. Can I just extend this past your family into your, into your jobs and into your schools? They have a different political opinion, opinion than you. They have a different uh, perspective of things than you. You're a Christian and they're not. I don't know what it is, but there's different things. You're going to go into the world and you're going to have to wash people's feet anyways, even though they look different, even though they have different perspectives, even though it's not easy, even though it's not something that you want to do. It's something that you're going to have to choose each and every day. And I want to I want to wrap up. I want to wrap up. I want to wrap up. You've got to demonstrate love during difficulty. Ask yourself that question. Do I demonstrate love during difficulty? Do I demonstrate love when it's not easy? Do I demonstrate love when it's hard? Do I demonstrate love even when I don't want to? Do I demonstrate love even when it doesn't feel like the thing that I want to choose? When it comes to our homes, when it comes to our homes, we absolutely, without a doubt, have to serve one another and choose to do it each and every morning, each and every day. We have to do it because here's the thing. There are going to be difficult days, but it's like I said, from the moment that your child is born, you have 6,570, I think that's the number, I didn't write it down, but it's like 6,000 and something days that you have with your kid. Your kid may be a senior right now, mom and dad. You have like 180 more days or so that you get to invest in them. And can I tell you something that's so cool? This is what is so cool. Jesus took the disciples through the discipleship process for three years, and then what did they do when he left? They advanced the kingdom of God. They, they, they continued to promote the church into the world. I mean, by promote, I mean they just went out and did everything that they had seen him do. They, they went out and replicated what they had watched him do. They, they, they replicated what they had walked with him as he was doing. I just want to ask you this. Why couldn't you do the exact same? Your kid can go and win an entire college if we disciple him effectively. If we, if we love them effectively. And I'm not saying that we're not doing it. I'm just saying, let's ask the question, how can I be more effective in advancing the gospel in the life of my child, in the life of my family, in the life that I have the opportunity of a lifetime to pour in to my kid? Can I just, I'm just, I'm about to, I'm about to be done. Part of that is making tough decisions, Right? Part of that is making tough decisions. Say one of the greatest things that could serve my kid is to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to help make them reprioritize their schedule because they're not going to choose the things that are going to be good for them. I'm going to have to choose some things that they wouldn't choose for themselves. Part of, a part of discipling and part of that process is, is, is making some of the difficult calls. Because can I, can I tell you, part of leadership, part of leadership is taking someone where they, they need to end up, not where they want to go. As a teenager, can I, I'm just going to give some testimony here before I close. As a teenager, where I wanted to go was a terrible place for me. <laughs> it was just, it was, it was a lot, it was, it would have been a lot of stupid decisions. Where I wanted to go was not a good direction. And you know what? For six years of my life, teens, listen to this. For six years of my life, I told my dad I hated him. And that he, he, was, he was my step back, by the way. That I hated him and that I did not want him to tell me what to do because he was not my dad. But you want to know what he did? He washed my feet anyways. I told him I hated him. I told him I didn't love him. That I didn't want anything to do with him. He's my stepdad. And it was all because he was pushing me in a direction that I didn't want to go, but he knew I needed to end up in a different one. I say all of that to say there are some decisions as a parent that you're going to have to make that are going to reorient the priorities of your teenager because it's going to get them in a direction they need to go, not the one that they would choose for themselves. Teenagers, let me just, let me just say this to you. There are some times that you get really mad at your parents because they make a decision that is, you, you feel like it's just, man, that's just so bad. My, why won't my mom let me have TikTok? Why won't dad let me have Instagram? Why won't they let me go to that party that's unsupervised? And you're like, man, my parents are just so bad. My friend's parents don't do that. My friend's, my, cross your fingers. 
right? Stomp up to your room or whatever. And you're mad because you're like, mom and dad are parenting me differently, but my parents, my, my friend's parents are so cool. They let them go do this. They let them talk like this. They let them watch this. They let them participate in this. And can I, can I just be honest? You want to know what that ends up? It ends up that that teenager goes in a direction that they do not need to get into, and it's years of trying to recycle and get back into a different position, a completely different place, because there wasn't guidance, because there wasn't firm direction, because parents were trying to be friends rather than trying to be parents. And so sometimes you get mad at mom and dad because they say, no, you can't have this or no, you can't do this. But really, you should thank God that they said, no, you can't have this and no, you can't do this. No, you can't go to that. The same, the same things I wanted to go participate in with some of those friends. Those friends are so far from God, it's, 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 it's wild. I say all of that to say, I'm trying to weave this back to my point. Family's complicated, and it's difficult, and it's beautiful, and it's great, and it's awesome, and it's rewarding. But we have to wake up each and every day and say, how can I move from the seat of wanting to be served and move to the surface, the floor of how do I serve my mom and dad? How do I serve my husband or my wife? How do I serve my kids? How do I serve my in laws? <laughs> oh. How do I serve? How do I serve? How do I serve? What, let me just say, last thing, last, last, last statement. What would your family look like if each and every one of you woke up constantly saying, How can I outserve everybody today and outlove everyone today? It's going to be an absolutely beautiful thing. We got to move from the seat of being served to the surface of serving others. God. Hey guys, I'm so glad that you decided to watch this message in our Family Matters series. If you want to connect with us more, you can head on over to Instagram at students underscore GFC if you have any questions or anything you'd like to talk about, or if you just want to see some more content uh, that we're putting out. So see you guys.